When you focus on the breath, you need a perception to hold you there. The perception can be an image you hold in mind, a visual image, or a word. A little sign to remind you this is where you want to stay. If it's a visual perception, this is where John Lee's instructions become handy. Because remember, we're not talking about the air coming in and out at the nose. It's not the tactile sensation at the nose that we're interested in. We're interested in the breath element in the body, the movement of energy. Without that movement of energy, the air wouldn't come in and out at all. So where do you feel it? As you breathe in, where is the movement? Where does it feel like energy is coming in? Or where does it feel like energy is radiating from inside the body? You have your choice of perceptions. And John Lee also recommends that you think of the breath energy entering at the back of the neck, going down the spine, down the legs, coming in the middle of the chest, going down through the organs, down into the intestines. Covering the whole body. And you're free to think of the breath in different parts of the body that John Lee doesn't mention at all. After all, there's breath energy in the head, breath energy in your tailbone. Sometimes there's a breath energy that comes up through the, it feels like it's coming up through the ground into your body. Wherever you feel it, and wherever it, whichever way of visualizing that helps the energy flow smoothly. Bring the body into balance. Use that perception. You have the choice. One of the stranger questions I was asked when I was up in Canada was whether it was true that we cannot change our perceptions. What this person had been taught was a pretty fatalistic version of the teaching, which is that whatever you experience in the present moment, well, that's what you've got to accept. And your perceptions are the way they are, based on past actions, so you've got to accept that. But if that were the case, there'd be no practice. There'd be no path. You couldn't change course. So the truth of the matter is that you can change your perceptions. Think about dependent core rising. It starts with ignorance. And it's not the case that the Factors in dependent core rising like billiard balls. In other words, ignorance has a little impetus that has an impact on fabrication. And then ignorance is out of the picture as you focus on what fabrication does with the next factor and what the next factor does with the next. Ignorance is there all the time. It sustains the whole process. But ignorance is something that can be changed by knowledge. Learn to look at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths and you replace the ignorance, at least for that time. And the suffering that would have come from the fabrication based on ignorance, that stops. So think of the factors of causation more as sustaining factors. As the Buddha said, we can't find the beginning point for ignorance back in time. But we can see what sustains it. It's sustained by the hindrances. So we work to overcome sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty or doubt, to bring the mind into concentration. When the mind is in concentration, then you can apply the Four Noble Truths. Ask the questions of the Four Noble Truths. Where is the suffering right now? What am I doing that's causing the suffering? And how can I stop? How can I abandon that cause? When you ask those questions, you can bring your appropriate attention to the breath. Because the breath is one of the things that is one of the forms of fabrication that's influenced by ignorance, but it can also be influenced by knowledge. When you fabricate in knowledge, you're turning into the path. So we do have this freedom. So take advantage of it. You can picture the breath in any way that you find helps you get in touch with how it actually feels right now and how it feels in such a way that you can make it more and more comfortable. Think of what you're experiencing, not as a given, something that's forced on you by the past. 
It's a range of possibilities, it's potentials that are here. And then you can activate the skillful and potentials, let the unskillful ones go. You see this throughout the Buddhist teachings. There's an awful lot of emphasis on the different kinds of fabrication, bodily fabrication, the way you breathe, verbal fabrication. Technically it's directed thought and evaluation, but it's the way you talk to yourself. And then mental fabrication, perception and, and feelings. And you can look at the Buddhist teachings and you can see that a lot of them have to do with instructions on how to fabricate more skillfully, how to breathe more skillfully, how to talk to yourself more skillfully, how to perceive things in a way that's more helpful. There's a passage where Venerable Sardibhuta lists four types of perceptions. He says it's because we don't understand these types of perceptions, in other words, seeing what these perceptions do to us. They don't get awakening, but when we do see what they do to us, the impact they have, then we can gain awakening. And he lists the skillful perceptions, not as just an interesting set of facts, but as possibilities. In other words, you can change your old perceptions and develop new ones. The first type of perceptions are the ones that he says have a share in decline. In other words, they give rise to more and more defilements, seeing beauty in the human body, seeing permanence in things that are inconstant, seeing ease in things that are stressful, seeing control in areas where you have no control. Those kinds of perceptions get in the way, the perceptions that would Aggravate, aggravate your lust, aggravate your anger. These things all have a share and decline. They're the kind of perceptions you want to avoid. If you find the mind giving rise to them, you can change your perceptions. The other three types are all skillful ones. The first ones are those that have a share in stability, the perceptions that allow the mind to settle down into concentration. These have to do with seeing the drawbacks of the hindrances on the one hand and figure out how to get past them. One of the reasons why the Buddha gives so many images, say, of sensuality, the negative side of sensuality. The mind is so inclined to see the positive side of sensuality, the thoughts of different pleasures that you'd like to pursue, that it needs strong medicine to see that sensuality is, as he said, it's like a dog chewing on some bones that have no meat at all. Otherwise you fantasize about sensual pleasures. But where are the actual pleasures? They're not there. In a John Lee's explanation of that image, he says, all the dog has is the taste of its own saliva. So you could think of your thoughts of sensuality as your mind's saliva coating everything you're thinking about. There's the image of the bead of honey on the blade of a knife. There's a little sweetness there, and but there's a lot of pain. The hawk that's flying off with some meat, and other hawks and crows fly after it, trying to tear the meat away from it, and they'll tear it up the bird itself if it doesn't let go. In other words, you gain sensual pleasures, and other people get jealous, and they tr they'll do what they can to get away, get, take them away from you. They don't care if they kill you. In other words, if you're looking for your pleasure in sensuality, you're looking in the wrong place, and you hold these images in mind, and they help get rid of the hindrances. But at the same time, you're going to need some perceptions that help stabilize you in concentration. This is why John Lee's images of the breath flowing through the body are so useful. Or the images in the canon of the, the bathman needing water through that ball of bath dough. In the same way, once there's a sense of pleasure for the breath, you try to knead it through the body. Wherever there's a pattern of tension in the body, you allow it to relax. You can make a survey of the different joints, starting with the joints of the fingers, going up to the wrists, elbows, shoulders, 
and down to the joints and the toes, up through the feet, wherever there's a connection between one bone and another. Think of the muscles around that bone relaxing. And you find the breath energy flows more smoothly through the body. Then there are other perceptions that have a share and distinction. These are the ones that get you into deeper states of concentration. We develop a sense that the breath energy is not so much coming in from the outside, it's actually radiating from within the body itself. And if you notice any blockage or anything that gets in the way of that breath energy radiating out through the entire body, think of it dissolving away. Hold that perception in mind. Or you can think of all the cells in the body breathing together, breathing in together, breathing out together. In other words, there's no one center from which the breath originates. It originates in every cell in the body. Those perceptions are really useful in, in allowing the in and out breath to calm down. And you have a sense of fullness that makes you realize that well, you don't need to pull things in from outside. And this allows the, the breath to grow still and minimizes the fear that you're going to have. Oh, if it, the breath doesn't come in and go out, you're going to die. You realize the breath is already there in the body, and as long as it's full, every cell feels full, every, every point in the body where you have any sensation at all feels full. You can settle right in, and there's no sense that you're lacking anything, even as the breath grows still. And finally, the per perceptions that have a share in penetration. In other words, this is the penetration that allows you to see through to the deathless. And these are the classic ones having to do with inconstancy, stress, not self. First you apply them to anything that would pull you out of concentration. You apply them to anything that would discourage you from being generous, that would discourage you from holding the precepts. Realizing that whatever reward you would get from being stingy or being unvirtuous, it's not going to last. And then you're left with the karma. That allows you to see the distractions and the temptations that would pull you away from the path is really not worth it. Then on the outside, Distractions are taken away. Then you look at the, the distraction of concentration itself. See that it too has drawbacks. Even your insights have their drawbacks. You can latch on to an insight, and ego can develop around it, and pride can develop around it. So you have to learn how to look even at your insights as inconstant, stressful, not self. That's how you get beyond them. This is why the three classic perceptions, and constantly stress and not self, those have to be let go too. So when you realize that these different grades of perception, they have these different impacts on the mind, and that you have the choice as to what kind of perceptions you're going to use, that frees you up. It's what makes the path possible. There's so much fatalism in the way that the Dharma is taught in the West that you simply have to accept whatever comes up. Part of this may be traced back to the, the commentaries when they talk about dependent core rising as having to span three lifetimes. Your ignorance in this lifetime will then cause birth in another lifetime, and then the craving in that lifetime, will, clinging in that lifetime, will cause another birth in a third lifetime. But it's crazy. The ignorance in one lifetime gives its fruit two lifetimes later. Or if you have craving in this lifetime, you wait for the suffering to happen in the next lifetime. That's not how the Buddha taught causality. It's, it's what's happening right now. And causality has enough of a pattern so you can understand it and work with it. But because things don't realize their potentials or actualize their potentials until you have mom present moment karma, what you 
intend in the present moment, and what you fabricate in the present moment. That gives you some freedom. And how you're going to choose to fashion things, how you're going to, whether you're going to choose to fashion a path or not a path, whether you're going to use the perceptions that make you hold on even to the path or the perceptions that allow you to let go of the path when the time comes. It's because all this is happening right here, right now, and it's actualized right here, right now. Through our intentions right now. That's why we can get free. So the past does have its influences. If it didn't have any influences at all, that the, the path wouldn't be possible either. It does have its influences, and you learn how to build on the skillful ones or convert the unskillful ones into something more skillful. It's like being a good cook. You may not have control over the produce that comes into your kitchen, but you can learn the skills to make good food of whatever there is. So always keep that possibility in mind. This is a skill that we master. And Mastering a skill requires some freedom of choice. And you always have the possibility of choosing the most skillful course of action. Your mind can make a difference because it can change. There's that passage where the Buddha says that the thing is as quick to reverse itself as the mind. And that can be negative if you're already on a positive path, then you suddenly switch direction and go back to a negative one. But if you find yourself on a negative path, you can you have every right to switch around, go back to the positive path. We have this strange tendency that when we're thinking unskillful thoughts, we feel that we're committed to them and have to see them through. But we're not so committed to the path. See your commitment the other way around. Unskillful things come into the mind, you find yourself following, you can stop at any time. then the decision to stop is meritorious right there. When you're on a skillful path, have a sense of commitment. You've been working so hard throughout these many lifetimes to get onto the path. Don't throw that good karma away. So we do have choices, and the choices do make a difference, which is why the Four Noble Truths are possible. All the Buddhist teachings are possible. That's why he taught. So always hold those possibilities in mind.